Tiger Woods, Elliot Spitzer, Bill Clinton. Three men, one primal urge. I did have a relationship with Miss Lewinsky that was not appropriate. I have acted in a way that violates my obligations to my family. I had affairs. I cheated. It's lust. It was wrong. I apologize. I am deeply sorry. What triggers lust? Do women succumb to it too? Can it be controlled? This is the science of lust. You know the feeling. A sexy smile. A body that demands attention. Your eyes lock and load. Suddenly, you're alert. It's starting. Lust. It's about to hijack your body and mind. Over the course of the next hour, a series of scientific experiments will expose exactly how lust works and how to control it, if and when you need to. Dr. Vlad Griscovicius is an evolutionary psychologist at the University of Minnesota. What motivates me is understanding why people do the things they do. And I get to get up every morning and see, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder why he did that. Let's explore that question. And more often than not in my research, it's come to be lust. Vlad believes that lust influences a vast range of human behavior. Not just mating, but hundreds of everyday activities, like the type of sunglasses you buy. Meet Jimmy, a mobile sunglasses salesman. He plies his trade up and down the glittering sidewalk of Hollywood Boulevard. Vlad has purchased Jimmy's entire inventory to perform an experiment. Vlad's goal is to see if lust unconsciously affects what men buy. The two options are this stylish but safe choice, or this brash pair of Elvis knockoffs. What do you think? Well, they look good. It's a good too. How do I choose? You've got most popular, or you've got most unique. Which one do you like? I'm gonna go with these. Probably these. It didn't take you long to decide those. Yeah, well, I kind of feel like the gold is a little audacious. All right, they're yours, thanks. Jimmy's been at it for an hour. Business is good, but only one style of shades is moving. Could it be that the location away from billboards and storefronts away from any obvious sexual imagery, is influencing the shopper's selection. All right, Jimmy, so, so far, what's selling best? Well, it's pretty clear the most popular glasses were definitely the most popular. What I want to do next is move this cart from this neutral background we have in the back right now, just down the street in front of a sexier store, one that has a lot more sexier things in the window. Sexier things like erotic lingerie? How will the men react now? Will the spicy backdrop make them bolder buyers? I actually like these. Yeah. I like Elvis these. Yeah, I kind of like these. They're unique. When I'm suited and booted, bro. Suited and booted. I like the gold ones, yeah. It's flashy and it's cool. I kind of like the way these feel more. I'm gonna go for the most unique. I like these. Oh yeah. Well, they're definitely uh, they're more unique and I'll definitely get you noticed. Well, go for the gold. Yeah, I like the gold. When this cart was parked in front of a neutral background, what a lot of the guys were choosing was the popular pair of sunglasses, the one that had over a million sold and that others were wearing. Then when we moved the cart just a little bit further down on the same exact street, what we saw is that when there are sex cues in the back, 
Somehow the guys began to preferring the unique pair of sunglasses, the one that made him stand out from the crowd. In fact, Vlad's subliminal lust cue persuaded over 60% of the men to choose the Elvis glasses. These blingy gold rims are like a male peacock's feathers. We know that men compete with other men for female attention because the guy who can stand out from the herd is the one that's more likely to be chosen as a mate. I'm gonna go for the most unique. Looking like a 70s throwback is not a problem as long as it makes you more likely to be noticed by a woman. That doesn't just apply to the clothes they wear or the cars they drive. Lust affects how men act in every way. Consider artistic creativity. This painting may not provoke lust, but it may have been inspired by it in one of the 20th century's most famous artists. If you take a careful look at Picasso's career, you see he goes from blue period to rose period to cubist period. And what you see is behind every single one of those transitions is a brand new woman, a new muse, who inspires him to change his style. So from Pablo Picasso to Salvador Dali to all these great artists, over and over again, there appears to be this muse who inspires them to their artistic greatness. Can lust drive any man to artistic heights? Forget about Pablo Picasso. How about Pete from Pittsburgh? Vlad has engineered another social experiment to see if he can bring out the inner artist in a bunch of guys who haven't painted since they were in the fifth grade. We're separating him to two different groups. One group of men will be just sitting by themselves at first, not interacting with anyone. After a few minutes in a rather uninspiring waiting room, each man heads in to meet Vlad. Hi, my name is Vlad. Hey, I'm Jason. Nice Jason, to meet you. have a seat right over here. So Vlad explains to the men that they're to draw for five minutes. Just express who you are, what you're about on this blank canvas. All right, well, I'll be back in about five minutes. This is challenging. That's looking excellent. That was five minutes? Yeah, that looks fantastic. Don't worry, that's what people do when they have about five minutes. He's just being nice. Picasso's kindergarten paintings were probably better than these. But now Vlad triggers the second and sexier part of his creativity experiment. This time, there will be a muse in the waiting room. Does lust make men more creative? One group of men tried their hand at sketching after sitting alone in a waiting room. Now, a second group is standing by. This time, they'll have some company while they wait. The charming and desirable Kate. So the major purpose of We Want You to Accomplish in here is when that guy leaves the room and is walking down the hallway, even though he's no longer physically in here, mentally, he's still in here. He cannot get you out of his mind. <laughs> Lights and cameras are readjusted. Kate preps her fake workplace, and Vlad cues the next set of male subjects. Lucky subjects. What's your name? I'm Kate. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Awesome. <laughs> it's a novel about no child left behind. I would be really interested to read that. What kind of music do you play? Old hardcore punk. Oh, that's really cool. It doesn't take a scientist to guess that it's more stimulating <laughs> to hang out with Kate than sitting by yourself in an empty room. It was a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, it was you. nice meeting you. Have a good one. You too. But will Kate change the way they handle their pastels? Hi. Hi. I'm John Bonavia. John, nice to meet you. Fantastic. Have a seat right here. How you doing? What am I good. about to paint? Vlad, like the Impaler. That's right. This is great. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing here today. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I love girls. It's kind of like all I think about. <laughs> the second group of men who came in after the mating crime was enacted 
they were like little peacocks. They just wanted to sprout those tails and just put in everything on a piece of paper. So are the effects of lust on creativity scientifically significant? Painter and art instructor Dave LeBeau will judge the quality of the sketches to see if, as a whole, one group was noticeably more creative than the other. So we line them up where one row is drawings by people who interacted with a muse, and another row is by men who did not have a muse, who just waited in a room by themselves. Now, do you think you would be able to tell which row was the muse row? For sure, I would say this top row has a much more, I mean, in all, this is complete row here, has much more energy. They're all much more expressive than this bottom row, for sure. I mean, look at the agitation. And that agitation came from the group that hung out with Kate. Our ancestors are the men that did become more creative around women, whereas those ones who didn't are no longer our ancestors. Lust makes men do whatever it takes to get noticed by women, whether it's by showing off their creativity or by simply showing off. But lust doesn't just control our outward behavior. There's a lot going on inside our bodies. Dr. Alessandra Rellini from the University of Vermont is studying the biology of sexual desire. Her scientific protocol doesn't involve x-rays or drawing blood. Instead, she shows her patients dirty movies. You're going to be watching two videos. One is going to be a video of uh, Russian culture, okay. uh, and then one of explicit sexual pictures. There is a heterosexual couple engaging in sexual behavior. Uh, throughout the entire uh, time of the videos are on, you move this to indicate how sexually aroused you feel. If at any Alessandra keeps well, careful track of how sexually aroused her subjects think they are, and compares that data with how their bodies react physically. To do that, she attaches sensors to measure vital signs like heart rate and blood pressure. And then there is the vaginal photoplatysmograph. This is something that you insert in your vagina on your own. I've never done anything like this. You know, you know you're doing it for science, so it's, it's you know, it's all positive. But, I don't know. This is a device that it's uh, one of the most commonly utilized devices to measure blood flow into the genitals. Now the capillary bed in the vaginal walls uh, become engorged with blood during sexual arousal. So we have an indirect measure of blood flow by looking at how much light is being reflected back. So with this we get to see what your body does and here you tell us what your mind does. Okay. Thank you. And you're sitting relaxed on your chair? Yeah, I'm all set. The first three minutes of the video the subject watches is a 1990s promotional film from the Russian Tourist Board. Its erotic content is non-existent. She's working just fine and she's down to the baseline. Then the video switches from Soviet propaganda to pornography. Immediately, the woman's heart rate accelerates, her body temperature rises, and the photoplethysmograph records increased blood flow to her genitals. Her vital signs say she's getting turned on, but her mind is having none of it. In fact, she's actually moving the dial lower. She feels she's getting turned off. It's a pattern Alessandra sees in most of the women she studies. For some women, while they're telling me, no, nope, this video is really not doing anything for me, it's not sexually arousing, we see actually their bodies responding a great deal. If you now want to follow me in, in the room. For male subjects, Alessandra uses a device similar to the plethysmograph to measure the change in blood flow to the penis. And once again tracks the relationship between bodily responses and mental arousal. This was the heart rate. When you take the man and you show the man an erotic video, and then you ask them how much sexual arousal did you experience during the video, their subjective response of how aroused they were, it's going to be highly correlated with what you see physiologically. You could definitely tell the difference from watching a video of a countryside and a road rather than pornography. Men get aroused quickly and they don't seem to have much of a mental filter when it comes to lust. One of the important differences between men and women and lust is that for men it's easier to become 
lustful. For women, it takes a little bit more time. Evolutionarily, women have had to be more careful because making a poor choice for a woman might leave you pregnant and without a potential husband. Men are wired for lust. Their bodies and brains react in perfect synchrony when they see something sexy. So what is the biochemical source of lust? Amsterdam, a city where lust stares back from every window front and sexual arousal is a taxable business. Dr. Leander van der Mey of Rye University in Amsterdam is a testosterone detective. He's trying to detect the first stirrings of lust by looking at changes in testosterone in men's bodies. What we're hoping to find out with this experiment um, is that testosterone is actually related with flirting and courtship. Even though he has a red light district on his doorstep, Leander prefers to work in a basement laboratory. His test subjects are all heterosexual men. Before the experiment begins, he asks them to give a saliva sample to get a baseline testosterone level. Next, Leander plants a young woman called the female stimulus person in another basement room. Okay, could you just pass that The men don't realize she's part of the experiment. Leander gives them both a Sudoku puzzle, then pretends to have brought the wrong ones and leaves the two alone. Hi. Hi. Hey, Hi. Yeah, I got it now. I face. Well, we instructed the female uh, stimulus persons to engage in a natural conversation, if possible. So what usually happens is that they start chatting, they start, um, well, uh, probing a bit, like, what are you doing here? And what I think what we did is actually captured the first glimpse of courtship. What uh, do you? We do uh, the social psychology research master. Okay. Net begonnen. Net begonnen? Eerste week. Leander then returns to the room, gives the man his new puzzle, and yeah. leaves with the woman. And after 15 minutes, we provide them with another saliva tube, and they provide another saliva sample. The saliva samples are analyzed for testosterone, while Leander also has the men fill out a questionnaire. So after the saliva sample, we just ask them, so how attractive did you find the, the stimulus person? Some subjects describe the woman as attractive. Others said, nah, she's not my type. But when Leander analyzes the men's saliva, he finds testosterone rises for all of them, no matter how they rated her. Even when a man doesn't think he's interested in a woman, testosterone is preparing his body for mating anyway. And we think that with testosterone, it's more like an automatic reaction. But I think what happens is testosterone feeds back again on the brain, and it actually prepares the human body for courtship. Well, look for men. And as testosterone rises, the men's behavior subtly changes. Heel mooi kasteel hadden ze gebruikt en nou iedereen bakken ze en zo. En de shoulders worden perhaps a bit more upright and open body posture. Nee, nog niet. Smiling perhaps a bit more, making eye contact. En men. Yeah. And we think that all these behaviors are actually moderated by hormones. A lot of the findings related to lust have been linked to the hormone testosterone, where for men, for instance, merely being in the presence of an attractive woman tends to bump up their testosterone, who leads them to want to show off in all sorts of different ways. You can think of testosterone as like being a gas pedal in the body, where once testosterone is being ramped up, it's like pressing the gas button and showing off and wanting to attract as much as you can. Leander's experiments with male testosterone appear to confirm what many women already know. Men are often governed by parts of their bodies south of their skulls. It's a biological impulse that helps keep 24-hour news channels in business. But is there any way for men to put on the brakes? Dr. Anna Rose Childress at the University of Pennsylvania has been looking at men's brains when they are looking at sex. We're hardwired for pleasure, but it looks like our brain um, has developed in a little different way for men and women with regard to their response to sexual cues. The brain response for men is 
it's just hands down stronger. Anna Rose is picking apart the mental steps on the way to lust. To do that, she asks men to lie in an MRI machine while she shows them pictures. Between some fairly mundane images, she throws in an erotic one that lasts just a split second. And then watches the mental fireworks go off. The first area to react is the amygdala, an almond-shaped gland at the base of the brain. Think of it as the brain's receptionist. From there, the signal gets passed up to middle management, the ventral striatum. Here, a chemical called dopamine is released. The more pleasurable the image is, the more dopamine floods into the brain. The final stop is at the medial frontal cortex. This is the brain's CEO. It decides what to do about this sexual opportunity. We've come to sort of appreciate the many different nodes in this pathway and that these sort of come on in sequence. They're early responders that have to decide very quickly if this is something worth pursuing as a reproductive opportunity. And then up to the frontal cortex, then this says, well, this looks pretty good, but uh, the last time that you acted on this reward impulse, I remember it didn't go so well because, and potentially can then have a sort of a top-down governing influence. Unfortunately, a man's calmer, more rational medial frontal cortex doesn't always suppress the primal urge welling up from the deeper parts of his brain. Sometimes, it just doesn't want to. Other times, it might be too slow. So, one of the issues with this circuit is that when cues come in, it's many milliseconds later before the upper parts of the circuit have a chance to weigh in and say, are you sure this time? Are you sure? What about last time? And to give a message back down that would essentially regulate or put on the brakes. You don't need a multi-million dollar MRI to see this mental tussle in action. All you need is a radar gun and someone who can walk like this. This is Jen. Her job is to see if she can catch the attention of a few passing men and their amygdalas. Across the street, technicians lie in wait with a radar gun and a stopwatch, recording how many men slow down and for how long. The first team calculates the average speed of cars on this side street when there are no distractions. 24 miles per hour. But once Jen starts to strut her stuff, it suddenly looks like it's rush hour. The average speed of male drivers is now down by almost a third to 17 miles per hour. When the brakes come on, it's a sure sign the driver's amygdala is lit up and his brain is flooding with dopamine. But it's only a matter of time before the signal percolates up to the frontal cortex and he thinks better of it. In fact, in this study, men slow down for around two and a half seconds before they decide to put the mental brakes on lust and get back on track. Thanks to testosterone and dopamine, we can create a timeline of male lust that's measured in seconds. Women's response times look almost geological in comparison. But if you think that means women are always in control of their lust, think again. Lust has men on the hair trigger. But with women, it's a much slower fuse. It's a difference born from hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. Over evolutionary history, it's been more adaptive for men to experience a lot of sexual desire and for women to be a little bit more cautious in their sexual desire. The more women a man impregnated, the more likely he is to leave offspring. 
If a woman becomes pregnant, that has tremendous amounts of costs. You have to go through the pregnancy, you have to help raise the child. So for women, it pays a lot more to be on the lookout for a good man rather than just any man. Women may be pickier, but men aren't entirely indiscriminate. And what they look for in a woman has given rise to a female version of peacock feathers, or Elvis sunglasses. When men are asked to choose between women, they're more likely to go for the one that's nicer, that's the more caring woman. And so what we find is when women have lust, romantic desire on their mind, they're displaying this niceness, this agreeableness. To prove his theory, Vlad is rigging the lobby of an office building and the street outside with some hidden cameras. The cover story for this experiment goes like this. There's a casting call for a TV show. The women are told they should dress as if for a first date. You want to just have a seat? Okay, thank you. The first group of women are asked to sit in an empty lobby and await further instructions. Afterwards, the women are going to come out here and they're going to see Rochelle with those boxes over here. And Rochelle's going to be a little bit struggling with the boxes. And we want to know whether the women are going to help Rochelle or not help Rochelle with the boxes. Watch what happens when these women are instructed to go outside and around the corner to the casting call. Do I have these to the left? To the left? Okay. Hi. Thank you. It's a cold, hard world out there on the streets of Hollywood. Now, did you notice the woman carrying the boxes? I noticed, and I was like, wow, she's really struggling. I was like, should I stop or should I not? I mean, I don't know why I was thinking so much into it, because usually I would stop. I don't think it would, if you're gonna help somebody, you're gonna help, but if you're not, you're just not going to help. And now for the second group of women. Same scenario, except this time, there are a couple of handsome, flirty guys in the lobby. Okay, that one looks all right. Here comes the first subject. And there she goes. Can we smell? No, I just didn't want to sit <laughs> Come right in between the Come two. On. It's know. more awkward to be like, hey, what's your... <laughs> what is your name? Oria. Oria, I'm Kareem. Kareem, nice to meet you. One of the men leaves, pretending to get a phone call, giving Kareem the opportunity to turn on the charm. Yeah, that's your style. Where are you from? I'm originally from Florida. Florida. But before that, I lived in New York. I met a girl from New York, and she was, she was like, yeah, out there? If we like, man, we just tell him. And I was like, you guys are, it just seemed like everyone's a little too aggressive for me. Uh, I just don't function like that as a person. Right. So, like, I would never <laughs> just go up to a guy and be like, ugh, you're the one I want. <laughs> You know, the man is supposed to be the pursuer, and yeah. the woman is supposed to be Which pursued. Which mostly... After a friendly conversation about dating, the woman is told to head off to the casting call. Bye. Nice meeting you. Do you need help? <laughs> yeah, if you could just get the door, please. Ah, oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Looks like you can depend on the kindness of strangers if they have lust on their minds. Hi. Uh, that was actually it. That walked down the end of the building, right? That's crazy. Hi, my name is Vlad. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. Hi, nice to meet you. Now, what we're actually interested in today is the kind of factors that lead others to help other people. So what was going through your mind when you saw this other woman and she was juggling some boxes and was trying to get into her car? It, it just seemed like it would take a second. It seemed harmless. Now, what... The second group display the classic behavior of women experiencing lust. Unconsciously, they want the man to know they are helpful individuals. Are you here for the show, too? Yeah, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what we're doing either. They just said, come like you're going on a hot first date, so... Maybe this is the first date. I know. <laughs> She looked like she was overwhelmed with the boxes, and I was like, oh my god, I'm an outfit. No, no, come on. 
But you do have ridiculous good eyes, though. Oh, They're thank gorgeous. you. Oh, what a tough job. Hold on, I'll get it for you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Women experiencing lust clearly want to show a man that they care about others. And the reasons, once again, are buried deep in evolutionary history. One possibility is that women who are nicer are less likely to leave the man, to cheat on the man in a future relationship. Another possibility is that the woman would be a better caring mother, which is, of course, very important in evolutionary history. So the next time you see a woman being nice, don't assume this is a selfless act. Her unconscious need to express her desirability as a mate is probably governing her behavior. The shadow of lust seems to fall over almost everything we do. Is there any way to be free of it? Consciously and unconsciously, evolution has hardwired us to act in a way that maximizes our appeal to the opposite sex. When people are in a lustful state, men spend more money, men become more aggressive, women become more altruistic, men make different financial investments. All of these behaviors that initially appear to be outside of the realm of mating or lust are all influenced by this very powerful biologic urge. But if lust is so deep set in all of us, this doctor shouldn't have any patience. But she does. Dr. Lori Brotto of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, works with women who suffer from low sexual desire. The studies have found that probably about 30 to 40 percent of women over the course of a year will report a period of a few months or more where they're not interested in sex. The clinical term for this is hypoactive sexual desire disorder, or HSDD. Some women experience extended periods without lust occasionally. But in others, the problem can become chronic. Lori's therapy starts with measuring women's mental and physical reactions to erotic videos. And then trying to boost that response. The secret to her success is surprising. A small wrinkled fruit. Choose one out of this tub and hold on to it. Don't do anything with it. She's trying to train her patient's brains to focus on the sensual. Slowly and gently bring the raisin to your lips without putting it inside. Notice what happens to your body as you anticipate putting the raisin into your mouth. We begin by encouraging women to practice these techniques in their everyday life. And then we gradually will um, tailor the exercises so that they can use them in the more sexual situation. For the vast majority of Lori's patients, sexual desire returns after a few months of this therapy. But a few are completely resistant. These people call themselves asexuals. Asexuality um, can be described as a lifelong lack of sexual attraction. So this is the individual who will say, I'm not interested in sex, I've never been interested in sex, I'm not attracted to men or women or anything, never have been, and it doesn't bother me. Our research has found that there are no differences in the um, body's ability to respond to sexual cues between asexual, homosexual, and heterosexual women. So there's not a dysfunction in you know, the central plumbing, if you will, in, in the body's ability to, to respond sexually. In terms of my sexuality, I define myself as a biromantic asexual. During high school and university years, I've noticed that I have no desire for members of either gender. Personally, I've come to peace with the fact that I don't experience sexual desire. The only time it ever gets a little bit complicated is when I get into a relationship with somebody. And uh, for me, it gets complicated because they don't understand how I feel and I can't understand how they feel. I, I really think that this is a distinct group. Probably about 1% of the population of men and women will report this lifelong lack of attraction, otherwise known as asexuality. It's like, would you prefer chocolate, strawberry, or vanilla? It's like, I like blueberry. It's not one of the choices. Just another flavor in the ice cream of life. 
I definitely feel like I was born this way. I think this is just a natural uh, flux in the human spectrum of sexuality. Asexuality suggests that the degree to which people feel lust is not a matter of choice. Instead, it could be an inborn trait. And if some people are genetically predisposed to lack lust, might others be born with an excess of desire? Dr. Dean Hamer, a geneticist at the National Cancer Institute, has stumbled across the first scientific hints that some people are really born to lust. Our discovery of these genes that are involved in libido was really pretty much of an accident. And it was kind of a, wow, what the heck is going on type of moment when those results came out of the computer. Dean had been running tests on thousands of people, trying to find correlations between their DNA and how they answered a personality questionnaire. One link he found was that people who expressed a heightened interest in risky sex all seemed to have a mutation on a gene related to dopamine. This gene controls how much people like to do new or different types of sexual experiences. So it doesn't really control how much you want to have sex, is whether or not you want to have a sexual experience that's a little bit different, a little bit novel. The connection makes perfect sense. If your brain produces more of the pleasure chemical dopamine than most people, you're likely to be a thrill seeker. And you'll get your thrills whichever way you can. But another genetic link to lust was more unexpected. A mutation connected to the brain chemical serotonin is known to cause high anxiety. Dean discovered it's also strongly correlated with a high sex drive. So that people with the anxious form of the serotonin transporter gene also have a higher level of libido and they're more likely to have sex, they have sex more frequently, they just have a higher sex drive altogether. Dean is sure the high-strung sex craze personality type is just the first of many surprises we'll discover as we begin to explore lust in our DNA. But lust is not the only biological force that drives us to have sex. Can love and lust find a way to live happily ever after? Men, women, lust, a highly charged cocktail that can lead to the deepest connection two humans can experience, love. But what happens to lust after we fall in love? Is love stronger than lust? Marty Hazelton, an evolutionary psychologist at UCLA, has developed a test to see whether feelings of love can suppress feelings of lust. Hi. Hello. I'm Dr. Marty Hazelton. Nice I'm to going to be you. running the experiment today. So what we would like you to do, and this is... My she invites couples to a lab and asks them to tell stories about their relationship in a private confession booth. Um, so what we'd like you to do is sit down in this chair and describe that for the camera. Okay. In this private setting, Marty encourages the participants to speak about their most sexually charged moments as a couple. One of the most memorable times that I was extremely attracted to my boyfriend was when we were dancing together and I swear we were the only two people there, it felt like, and I just wanted to take him home right away. So the moment I felt the most intense sexual desire would be last night and uh, last night was phenomenal. The most intense sexual period we've experienced so far in our marriage was definitely at the beginning because it was so brand new and so exciting and we, you know, obviously hadn't done it yet. So um, that was the most intense uh, time of our marriage so far. Immediately afterwards, she asks each subject to rate the attractiveness of a series of photos of the opposite one. sex from one all the way up to a perfect ten. Eight. Because we're concerned that people might not be totally truthful with us in their ratings, we're also going to record how long they spend looking at those ratings, but we're not going to tell them that. So that's going to be our m more subtle measure of um, whether they are more attracted to those photos. Easy two. Uh, three. Uh, six. <clears throat> One. Five. Across the board, subjects lingered longest on images of young, scantily clad members of the opposite sex and rated them Seven. highest. 
But this is just the first part of Marty's experiment. Now, she and her research associate bring a second set of couples into the confession booth. Instead of having them talk about lust for their partner, she has them talk about love. The first time I saw my girlfriend, we were out uh, in a nightclub and uh, we kind of, we locked eyes. There was a moment in time where, you know, everything had gone still and we were really connected in a way that is hard to describe. Uh, I asked her to marry me and she said yes. And boy, I'm telling you, that was the happiest moment. I think I sweated out a shirt, a coat, and part of my hair, too, as well. When I first met Dustin, uh, he came into where I was working. And I don't know, it just it just seemed right. And I remember we were at work, and this is who I'm supposed to be with. I'm not supposed to be with someone that I have to chase. I think we both were in love at first sight. When the couples whose brains have just been thinking about love rate the photographs, the results are strikingly different from the couples who'd been primed to think about lust. Five. We saw that men who were in the love condition, there was one very attractive woman wearing a bikini and um, standing in kind of a sexy pose. And when they viewed her, they tended to click by as fast as possible. My sight really isn't wandering. It's, it's much more focused on her. Um, men in the love condition are pushing relationship alternatives out of their mind and doing so successfully. Six. They didn't do that as much when they were in the desire condition. So thinking about love suppresses the desire to stray, especially for men. But thinking about sex, even if it's with your partner, opens the door to lust for others. When the woman in the bikini popped up, uh, you did spend significantly longer time looking at her than any of the other images. However, that's what all the men in the study have been doing. When men are primed to think about sexual desire, they're spending significantly more time looking at that image. I definitely think that when we're primed for sex, we could lose control. You know, it's, it's easy to lose control. You can look for anybody, you know. And in both cases, you're feeling a very positive emotion toward your romantic partner, but only in the case of love does it help you defend against relationship alternatives. Evolution designed lust to help us find and mate with a partner. It also designed love to help us stay together to raise children. And these two deep emotional drives are locked in permanent conflict. There probably is a, um, a, a tug of war over, over the course of relationships and across relationships between feelings of lust and feelings of love for the partner. It's difficult to suppress lust completely, where it's always there underneath our skulls just waiting to come out. Every moment of every day, lust is at work inside us, pumping dopamine into our brains, hormones into our bloodstreams, directing how we spend our money, pushing us to creative heights, helping us be helpful, driving us to fall in love, but always tempting us to stray. Lust never takes a break. I see lust as being kind of like the backseat driver of our behavior, where lust steers our conscious decisions in unconscious ways. And I'm always looking to find out, well, what other kinds of things does lust influence? Does it influence our parenting behaviors? Does it influence our behavior at work? How productive we are at work, how efficient? And my bet is that it does. Right now I see this type of research as only really being at the very tip of the iceberg.